about 30 minutes. After his presentation, there will be time for questions, and I will be collecting the questions and post them to Steve. That said, you don't have to wait until the end of Steve's presentation to type your questions. So you might want to post questions on the chat box while Steve is speaking. Alternatively, if you want to wait until the end of the presentation, you can always type your questions there and then, and I will give you time for that. Tomorrow, you will receive an email from us with a link to access the video recording of this webinar. Enough of me now. It gives me great pleasure to welcome back Professor Steve Strand, who will be speaking to us about the findings from his latest research report, EAL Proficiency in English, Educational Achievement and Rate of Progression in English Language Learning, which was published yesterday. Steve is Professor of Education at the University of Oxford. He holds a first-class BA Honours and a PhD in Psychology. His research interests are in the associations of ethnicity, social class and gender, with a wide range of educational outcomes at all stages of schooling. He has almost 100 scholarly publications in the field, including international peer-reviewed journal articles, book chapters and research reports. He has been advisor to the Department for Education and special advisor to the House of Commons Education Select Committee. Over to you, Steve. Steve, sorry, I can't hear you. Can you turn on your mic, please? I think if you speak now, we might be able to hear you. Okay, yes, is that better? Yes, okay. So, yes, I was just saying this is only my second webinar, and I still find it very strange to be um, to be uh, shouting at my computer, um, which doesn't feel very natural at all. I've got one problem here, Sylvain, which is I can't see my slides. Ah, oh, I see up here. Sorry, yep, yep, yep. There we go. That's brilliant. Thank you. So, uh, without uh, further ado, here we go. Right. So, this is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, Savannah's already giving you the introduction to that. Um, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover a series of three reports that have been funded by the Bell Foundation and by Unpound Philanthropy over the course of the last five years um, and give you some headline findings from the last two reports. Um, so the uh, one that came out yesterday is the 2020 report uh, on the far right there. But in order to make sense of that, I need to tell you a little bit about the context in, in terms of the earlier research findings. So I'm going to run through that first report and the Department for Education's policy response to that because it's that policy response that informed the second two pieces of research. And just to give you the headline message that um, I want you to go away with uh, from, from this webinar, uh, four key points really. The first is that proficiency in English is the key predictor of educational achievement among pupils with English as an additional language. Um, I know that's an easy surprise, but it's not what we actually assess at the moment. Um, so that's important. To, just make it clear just how important that is. That age is the most important predictor of proficiency in English. So levels of proficiency in English are uh, substantially lower in the early years than they are at age 16, for example. And actually, that's a much stronger predictor um, than any other demographic like uh, uh, pupil background factor. Age is kind of the overriding thing. The third point is that by tracking young people who start um, in reception new to English, we find that it takes at least six years for the majority of pupils new to English to become competent or fluent in English. So there's a minimum period of six years. So putting those together, uh, the implications for policy and practice are that we need to assess proficiency in English. It's absolutely vital that we do that in order to identify and address the needs of young people with English as digital language. And it also means that our current funding formula, the national funding formula in England at least, is rather poorly targeted because it's giving money to a lot of young people who already might be proficient in English. Uh, but for those who are not proficient, it's too short term because it's only funding for three years 
when we know that it takes at least six. So those are kind of the, the, the key points I'm going to end with, but I just want to start with um, giving you that heads up, but now I'll fill in all the gap in between. So just one page really to look at that first report. So what I identified was it's a large and growing population of EAL speakers in schools in England. So currently in 2019, the latest data available, there's over 1 point, actually 1.6 million young people or 20% of the school population aged 5 to 16. So one in every five pupils is recorded as EAL. But they are very unevenly distributed across the country, so they're very much concentrated in large urban areas. So 17 of the 20 authorities with the highest level of EAL are London local authorities. Um, but they're also particularly concentrated in some schools. So although there's that 20% average across the whole country, um, in many schools, in fact, in over half our schools, there's less than 5% of pupils with EAL. But at the other end, it's rather skewed. There are about 10% of schools that have a majority of pupils with EAL, so more than 50% of their pupils are EAL. So that average figure is very misleading at, um, at the school level. And interestingly, some of those schools with more than 50% of kids on uh, recorded as EAL are not in the high density um, areas like the London authorities or Luton or Slough or there's other big concentrations. So it's very um, unevenly distributed across particular schools. So a kind of area-based um, resourcing wouldn't work very well. You do need something that's focused on particular schools. Um, but their achievement gaps uh, did exist in relation to EAL in reception and the early years, but actually they washed out fairly quickly. So apart from reading, um, which did persist as a gap through uh, 7 and 11, um, everything else was pretty much um, no difference between EAL um, and uh, first language English pupils after the age of seven. So that included maths, it included phonics, which is interesting, it included uh, spelling, punctuation and grammar. So a lot of the rules uh, of language in that sense, there was no um, difference between EAL and first language English speakers and, and no difference in, in all subjects really by 16. So early, early differences in achievement, but um, quite rapidly diminishing. Uh, pupils with EAL making more progress than first language English speakers at every key stage. No negative association between having a high proportion of young people with EAL in a school and the achievement of first language English peers, which I think is quite an important, uh, important finding. Um, and the risk factors for low attainment were generally the same, whether you were EAL or first language English. So um, uh, being young for your age group, um, summer ball pupils, boys having an SEN, being entitled to free school meals or living in an area of high economic deprivation. These were risk factors both for EAL pupils and first language English pupils. But there were some factors that were particularly a risk amongst EAL pupils, and that was uh, being from white other or black African ethnic groups and particular languages. Uh, and this is largely associated with patterns of migration, so large proportions of these uh, particular groups. So Portuguese speakers, um, uh, East European languages uh, like Polish, uh, those, those uh, groups were much more likely uh, to be low achieving if they were EAL um, than otherwise. Lack of prior attainment, again, uh, an indication if you don't have a prior attainment uh, score from the start, the key stage, another sign of inward migration. Uh, moving between schools frequently and living outside of London, these were particularly high risk factors for low attainment amongst white British, um, amongst EAL pupils. Okay, um, so that was the kind of substantive conclusions, but maybe the major conclusion was about the limitation uh, about the way we record um, data on EAL pupils in the National Pupil Database. The major thing being people usually treat the EAL flag as if it's some measure of proficiency in English and it absolutely categorically is not. This is the actual definition of, uh, um, uh, uh, that defines who's recorded as EAL in the National Pupil Database in England. Um, and a first language other than English should be recorded when the child was exposed to the language. And it's not necessarily a speaker of it, but exposed to the language. 
um, and not necessarily in the home or in the community. Um, and if you were exposed to more than one language, um, which may include English, the language other than English should be recorded irrespective of your fluent proficiency in English. So uh, it's about being exposed to a language, maybe in the community, um, and you'd be recorded as EAL even if you speak English perfectly well. So within our definition of EAL, we have uh, kind of one uh, end of the extreme, newly arrived pupils um, who speak, read or write little or no English. Um, and then at the other end of the extreme, we have children born in the UK who may be exposed to another language as part of their cultural heritage, uh, but are using English as their everyday language um, and actually are perfectly fluent in it. And then in the middle of those two uh, extremes, we probably have some young people who are also newly arrived, but maybe from a bilingual background, maybe having um, attended an English language school abroad or whatever. So uh, it's an extremely heterogeneous grouping and it is not a flag of what is really important, which is how um, well you can access the curriculum through the medium uh, of English, which is how our curriculum is delivered. Uh, and that's what we really fundamentally need to know. We can try and proxy this through other measures that are in the MPD. So this is some data put out by the DfE last year, and it's looking at um, the Key Stage 2 results in 2018, and what proportion of young people achieve the expected level in all of reading, writing and maths. And then it's looking at that by the year they first entered an English state school. So what we see there is that around about 79% of the pupils recorded as EAL first entered a state school way back in reception. And actually the achievement of those pupils is above average by the time they're 11. So for about 80%, four and five EAL pupils, they enter in reception, they're achieving by 11 above the national average. The negative association tends to be um, related to EAL pupils who enter after reception and seems to be uh, strongly linked to how recently you've entered. So um, by the time you get to young people who enter in year six, i.e. the year of the Key Stage 2 assessment, only 18% are achieving the level of success um, that, that is, the national average is about 65%. So we've got some uh, indications here that there's something going on about um, new, uh, new, new, new migration. But of course, as I said in the last slide, some of those newly entered pupils may, may indeed be newly entered to England, but from Wales or Scotland um, and have English as their um, as, as language that they're perfectly fluent with, um, or they may be international arrivals uh, who also have an English uh, instruction background. So it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship between the date, uh, year of entry, um, but it could well be that there's a proxy here for the underlying factor, which is proficiency in English. And pupils who are more recently entered the country um, who achieve lower levels are actually those who are not proficient in English. And actually there's quite good evidence um, from 15 years ago, some work I did with Faisa Demi in Lambeth, LA, uh, where we looked at that uh, authority about 37% of the pupils at that time were EAL in that authority. And this is looking at, again, the Key Stage 2 average point score and this is the monolingual English pupil, um, um, uh, average score. And then these are the EAL pupils. Um, now, this uh, group here, all these groups are EAL. But what the authority was doing was using something called the Hillary Hester scales. Uh, and the teachers, supported by the uh, local authority language service, were estimating um, the uh, stage of fluency in English of the EAL pupils whether they were beginning to learn English, whether they needed considerable support, whether they still needed some support, or whether they indeed were fully fluent in English. And you can see that the, although these are all EAL pupils, the difference in their achievement is substantial and strongly related to their proficiency in English. So if we look here, there's an eight point difference in terms of Key Stage 2 scores. Those of you who are around and remember uh, uh, average point scores, that's equivalent to 30 months. So that's kind of two and a half years 
of educational progress as was conceived in the old national curriculum. So, you know, two and a half years of achievement difference between those who are beginners uh, and those who are fully fluent. So clearly, EAL itself is a poor flag because you could be EAL and fully fluent and indeed scoring above the average for monolingual pupils. So actually being bilingual there is it's positively associated with achievements. Uh, but if you were a beginner or needing considerable support, the level of achievement were very much lower. So that's where we, um, that was one of our major conclusions from the report. And the DfE were very good. They responded um, in a very positive way to that. We presented the results to the department and they actually introduced um, a measure of proficiency in English uh, on an A to E scale. And they had a very clear rationale for doing it. And that's quoted there about providing important national data on this high needs group um, and being able to identify and address uh, needs uh, for those who face additional educational challenges, which clearly, if you cannot speak the language of instruction in school, you're not going to be able to access the curriculum. So that is indeed uh, very much an additional educational challenge. Um, the, for those of you who are in schools, um, you may remember what the uh, assessment looked like. So it's basically a best fit judgment. It adopted a measure that's been used in Wales since 2009. So this has been around for a long time in Wales. I've been recording it for 12 years. Um, and essentially, there are the little vignettes there, um, and you make a best fit judgment about where you think the pupil fits in those um, five stages. So new to English, uh, at the early stage of acquisition, consolidating and developing uh, competence, competent and then fluent. Uh, and that was introduced by the department in 2017, in January 2000 school census, um, and repeated in the 2000 and 18 census. So that's the good news, um, followed then by the bad news, um, <laughs> which was that after having uh, completed that, uh, uh, entered that item, and uh, all schools having made those assessments, or at least a large proportion of schools having made those assessments, some were still in the process of, uh, uh, of doing, uh, of coming to terms of having to record all that data. Um, it was dropped from 2019. Um, so actually, it was kind of a one step forward, two steps back um, problem. Um, and it was largely associated, and this is a matter of uh, kind of personal opinion, but not my view, it was uh, associated with the conjoint collection of data, not just on proficiency in English, but there were three data items that were introduced, also people's country of birth and their nationality. So it's compounded proficiency in English with nationality. Um, and it also came out at the same time that the DfE had passed information from the National People Database to the Home Office uh, in cases of illegal immigration. And that caused something of a, of a how, um, uh, the, some genuine concern was expressed by people, which caused quite a lot of pressure on the department. Uh, and as a result of that, the department uh, initially uh, said that they would not uh, release the data uh, outside of the department and then subsequently the seen even decided to stop collecting the data. So effectively, I think we've had the baby, the proficiency in English measure, thrown out with the bathwater, which is a nationality measure. Um, I mean, I cannot see the uh, educational value to young people of having data on their nationality included in the NPD. I can see a lot of value in having data on proficiency in English. Um, but because these three items were introduced together, any legislation that, um, that was um, directed at one of those items had to be directed at all three. So you either had to have all three or you had to have none. Um, hence the, 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 the move to drop it. And then not only was um, no analysis ever produced by the DfE, apart from the next item I'm going to show you, on the data, um, but it wasn't available to researchers. So it wasn't released into the National Pupil Database for other researchers to fill the void to do some analysis on that data. Um, so the only um, information that was released from that whole exercise was this one slide, which is the total of all pupils aged five to 16 um, what proportion were recorded in the 2017 census at each of those levels. And about 5% of pupils were 
new to English, about 11% at early stages of acquisition, around about 33% um, were fluent and 8.7% 8 were not yet assessed. That's of the 18% of pupils overall who were recorded as EAL in 2017. And that actually uh, is all that the department had ever released about proficiency in English until today, um, where they actually, three over three years after they collected the data, Today, the department released a report. They must have known I was doing the webinar, obviously, so they, they sort of thought they'd cut, cut the ground from underneath me, and today they have released the report. So if you go on the, the gsi.gov.uk website, there is an analysis of the pilot data. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but they have actually produced something, which is a positive thing, so I'm, I'm glad that the data has been um, looked at. But up until today, this was the sum um, of data in the public domain in terms of analysis of the proficiency in English data, which given the amount of effort involved uh, in collecting it, um, I think was, um, yeah, it was a shame. So that's what really drove the first, the, the middle report there, the Strand and Hassel 2018 report, um, because there was no data being released uh, by the department and there was no access to the data from the department, we worked with some partner and local authorities to actually collect and analyze data on proficiency in English and educational achievement. So we wanted to find out uh, what the relationship was between proficiency and achievement uh, for all pupils uh, age 5 through to 16 in all the national assessments, uh, key stage uh, reception, key stage 1, key stage 2 and key stage 4 in English but also in maths and in overall measures and we also wanted to be able to compare pupils with the EAL to first language English. Um, so we asked for this uh, data, totally anonymised, absolutely anonymised at the pupil level um, from uh, partner authorities and we had data um, from uh, six local authorities and 1,500 odd schools and 140,000 pupils um, giving us all that, all that data. So that was a, that was a, a you know, very welcome initiative working with local authorities to actually um, collect a large and representative data set. It was representative. These are the uh, stats on, on that. So um, we have a, a large inner London borough, uh, a very large southern shire county, um, two outer London boroughs. You remember I said 17 of the top 20 authorities of EAL London, so we weighted um, that towards London. Uh, a big West Midlands metropolitan borough and a large northern city council. Um, looking at those all together, the uh, proportion of the AL is slightly higher than nationally, 24.8 versus 19%. Um, but that's the only, uh, and that was appropriate because we obviously wanted to get authorities that had a sufficient number of AL pupils. Um, but in every other measure, in free school meals, in the proportion of um, black and Asian minority ethnic pupils and percentage of girls, it was bang on. And in fact, in the average attainment scores at all of the key stages and at the uh, end of foundation stage, um, the averages for the sample were spot on the average for the national. So this is nationally uh, representative sample of 140 odd thousand pupils. So we can be pretty sure that what we find here is robust and generalizable to England as a whole. So what do we find in terms of relationship between um, those outcomes um, and other demographic factors? Well, that's our data for the whole sample. So that's the um, same data as I showed you in that DFE single graph, around about 5% new to English, uh, around about 12, 13% early access. position and so on about just over 33 percent fluent and um, so that's the same uh, as the DFE released for overall but of course what we're able to do now is look at that by age so we can look at that for the pupils uh, at reception for pupils at the end of key stage one end of key stage two i.e 7 11 and at the end of key stage four i.e 16. so what we find immediately is if we look at the portion of pupils who are uh, new uh, to English. Here we find that that's around about 15% uh, reception, but that drops right down to just about 1%. Um, and that's also true for those at early acquisition. So pupils who are early stage of acquisition, very high in reception, but drops down. 
<coughs> um, and the opposite of that, uh, those people who are fluent or competent goes the other way around. So if I actually just give you a little summary here. So in reception, um, averaging over stages A to C, so new to English, early acquisition or developing competence, i.e. all at stages of acquiring English, 70% um, uh, of pupils uh, in reception, of EAL pupils in reception are at those stages, and about 30% are competent or above. Um, and then you see massive changes over, uh, over time. This is obviously cross-sectional data, um, but the, these trends are kind of what we would expect to see given what we have seen in terms of progress before uh, the individual longitudinal level. So essentially we, we uh, have a, almost a, a, an inverse a flip here. So by key stage four, 85% of EAL pupils are competent and above. There's still need, even at key stage four, 15% of pupils are still acquiring English. So that speaks to the importance still of um, having a measure um, of proficiency in English later on because there's constant um, inward migration and a lot of those pupils do have language learning needs. But clearly the, the, the high proportion is centered around reception. What about the relationship with achievement? So this is the reading and maths outcomes for key stage one. And what we see is a really, really strong relationship between your stage of proficiency in English um, and the outcomes. This is looking at the percentage of young people who achieve the expected standard um, in reading. And that is the national average, you at the dotted line. Um, if you look at people who are new to English at early stages of acquisition, very low proportions are being successful uh, in terms of that outcome. Developing competence is around about the national average, but those who are competent and fluent are actually doing better in terms of achieving success um, in reading uh, at seven than, um, than those people say, and for higher uh, outcomes than the national average yeah and a similar picture for maths so very uh, very marked differences in relation to your proficiency in english which we see again if we look at the uh, measures at age 11 now and we look here at the scaled scores so you can be awarded a scaled score uh, which will range between 80 and 120 in both reading and both maths based upon the tests uh, independently assessed and um, uh, administered. Uh, and what we see here is, is very much the same um, picture, particularly big differences for reading. So significantly different um, mean scores um, at, all, um, at all levels there, no overlap in the confidence intervals. Uh, again, pupils who are fluent in English and have an additional language do better than the national average. So that point again about bilingualism itself not necessarily being uh, a hindrance, but if you are acquiring um, facility in the language of school instruction, then that seems to have a very negative association, as one would expect with achievement in reading. Not such a strong association with maths, so in fact, um, you know, very much closer to the uh, to the national average, but still some association there. This. Um, represents a, a 20 point difference between the mean score of those who are new to English and the mean score of those who are fully fluent. Uh, those who like working in standard deviation units, that means that's a two standard deviation difference, which basically means it's massive. <laughs> yeah. um, um, and that, you know, that, that, that is totally uh, related to the, um, to the proficiency in English. And this is the GCSE score, so still um, some differences here. Very uh, fewer pupils um, are actually in these stages compared to the early data, but the pattern between your stage of proficiency in English and your outcome is, is just as strong. And to give you some idea of this difference as well, that's again, that's two standard deviations. Um, but another way of thinking about it is 40 points. This is the key stage four attainment eight score a 40 point difference in the means of those new to English versus fluent is like passing eight subjects all at grade five or above and passing eight subjects at a mixture of grade one and grade two in the new one to nine GCSEs. So it, it's, it's a massive, massive difference again. Um, another way we decided to look at that, because uh, obviously 
the defining feature there of EAL people's achievement is their proficiency in English. Um, another way to look at that was through a regression analysis where we say what proportion of the outcome in terms of educational achievement can be accounted for by, um, by various different predictors. And if we look at a standard set of demographic predictors, if you look at ethnicity, gender and free school meals, for example, in the early years total point score at the end of um, foundation stage, at the end of reception, we can explain about 3.7%, just under 4% of the variation in the scores and the outcomes through knowledge of those kind of background demographics about your poverty, gender and ethnicity. With PI, we can explain 18% of the variation. Okay, for EAL, this, this is all based on EAL pupils, uh, only EAL pupils. Um, and if we put the two together, we can explain up to 20% of the variation. But you can see there's a massive difference here. And this is true whether we go through the key stage two outcomes and the key stage four outcomes. We explain relatively small proportions of the variation in outcomes based on people demographics. Um, but we explain you know, between four and 10 times more of the variation if we know about proficiency in English. So if we look at reading, key stage two reading score, we can explain 2% of the variation in the score of the AL pupils through knowledge of common demographics such as ethnicity, gender, and preschool meals. We can explain 22% of the variation if we have pi. Um, so clearly, it's, it is overwhelmingly the best predictor um, of, of the uh, variation in educational achievement of young people with English and additional language. So key conclusions from that are that pupils with EAL vary very greatly in their proficiency in English. And this isn't trivial when the language instruction is English. It's absolutely central to uh, young people's ability to access the curriculum. And that PI varies very widely by age. So about three quarters of pupils are acquiring proficiency at reception. That drops to only about half of the EAL pupils at key stage one, a quarter of the EAL pupils at key stage two, and down to 15% at key stage four. So there's good um, uh, increases in acquisition as young people get older, um, but there's still need even at key stage four. Um, that PI is the most powerful predictor uh, of educational achievement at all ages, um, and that being bilingual actually seems to be a positive um, association with achievement if you're uh, fluent in two languages, if you're fluent in English and in another language, actually that's that's kind of positive boost. It's not being fluent in a language, which is the key. Um, and PI itself can explain four to 10 times more of the variation than common demographic factors. Okay. But there's one um, factor that we haven't taken into account there, and it's a key question for, uh, for teachers, for people developing the curriculum, for uh, local authority support, for government, for everyone really. And that is, uh, if we do identify uh, young people when they uh, arrive at school and, and identify their stage of proficiency in English and identify those who are new or at the early stage of acquisition, how long will they need support for in order to become competent or fluent in the English language? Uh, and for that data, we need, um, we need a lot of time. We need uh, longitudinal data that's tracked a large sample of pupils over a long period of time. And that's something that we um, don't really have in terms of uh, the NPD in England, but I'll come on to where we can find that data. It's important when we think about this to think about two levels of what competence or fluency in English might mean. And Cummins has made a distinction which is very often picked up between basic interpersonal community skills or BICs. Commonly, you might just say this is just a conversational language. So things like oral fluency, phonology, listening comprehension, basically language that is conversationally undemanding, um, it's, it's cognitively undemanding, it's embedded in context. Okay? And that's distinct from more academic language, basically cognitive academic language, which is really what you need for learning academic subjects. So then you're moving on to measures that are more about vocabulary, about reading comprehension, yeah, and a much more demanding side. So there's conversational um, acquisition, of uh, fluency conversationally, and then there's cognitive academic fluency. So it's important to keep this um, distinction in mind. 
So if you go back and look at what literature has been published, um, you find a lots of references to Cummins and to Collier. But it's interesting when you actually read the originals. I think a lot of um, other papers cite these um, studies without maybe actually having read them in detail. Because when you read them, you realise that the strength of the evidence is relatively weak. And so if you look at Cummins' work, it's about 1,200 migrants who arrived in Toronto in Canada. Um, and they look back at uh, how um, many years they'd been in the education system in Toronto and compared their mean scores uh, to the native uh, mean scores. So what they found was oral fluency, uh, sound discrimination, sound recognition, um, the mean score was below the native mean for those uh, up to three years after arrival. Um, whereas for vocabulary scores, the more cognitive uh, academic language, the mean scores of the young people who arrived in Toronto was below the native mean up to five years post arrival. So that was summarised as it taking at least five years on average to acquire cognitive academic proficiency. Collier study is the other one that's cited very often. This was one and a half thousand. Uh, limited English proficiency pupils in one US school district, looking at their achievement at grades four, grade six, grade eight and 11. And there they looked at the mean national centile uh, reading score. So where that centile is at 50% or above, then you're saying the average for the group is the same as the average for native speakers. Um, and that was true by grade four to grade six, giving an estimate of about three to four years after arrival. Uh, slightly longer for certain age groups, which led her to suggest that actually a range of four to eight years is necessary to achieve native grade mean norms. So to actually have on average achievement of the uh, EAL pupils at the average of um, native speakers. So those are both quite problematic designs really. Um, so Collier, I mean, it tells you nothing about the range of achievement within this group of, of pupils in, in one authority who have uh, uh, arrived um, in school at some stage um, during their early education. Um, and the same is true uh, of Cummins. It tells you something about variation, it does tell you a limited amount about variation. Um, there's a better study, Hakuta, Butler and Witt, which has actually done what we really want to do here, which is take a group of pupils and follow them longitudinally. So the other two studies were retrospective, um, finding the pupils then looking back um, uh, at their profiles of entry, whereas what we really want to do is grab a group of pupils as they arrive um, in reception and then track them through. Hakuta did that and they came up with estimates again of two to four years for oral fluency, four to six years for um, cognitive academic language. So there's there's not a lot of research around and um, what there is is actually quite old and quite um, dated on quite small samples with rather uh, questionable methodology in some cases. It's only one uh, England study or one UK study actually and that's uh, Demi. Um, and that's quite an interesting study, but it again is retrospective. So it looks at a sample of people who had achieved fluency, uh, fully fluent, and then looks back to say where they started from. But there are obviously uh, errors of omission um, when you take that kind of retrospective approach. So um, what we really need is something that um, will address some of these um, limitations, uh, which, I've, which I've highlighted there. So what we really want is a prospective study it's longitudinal, that follows uh, a large and nationally representative sample of peoples over time. And we found that in the Welsh data set. So I mentioned earlier that the uh, measure of proficiency in English that was introduced in England was based on, well, it wasn't just based on, it was the Welsh measure. So we went back to Wales, and um, thanks to Stephen Hughes um, at uh, Government, Government Wales, um, who facilitated our access to the pupil level annual school census or plus data set. And we were able to pick up uh, a large sample of 5,500 EAL pupils who entered reception classes in mainstream schools uh, at age four or five between 2009 and 2011. 
and then we want to track these pupils over their subsequent six years of primary school using the annual teacher assessment of, of proficiency in English, which is the same as we've just described for, for England. Um, it's important to say that this is first language English, uh, this is, this is uh, first language other than English or Welsh. Okay, Welsh speakers are not considered to be EAL. Um, first language is uh, English or Welsh. You don't record proficiency in English. This is for people who are not, uh, young people who are not English or Welsh speakers. So uh, Welsh and not EAL. Um, and our key focus was on 2,000 odd of these young people who are uh, children who were new to English, i.e. at level A in reception. But we did look at the progress of all pupils. We also looked at people who started reception at B, uh, a stage of early acquisition, or those who started at developing competence. So we looked at everybody, but I guess the key um, things I'm going to show you now are really based on those young people coming to reception, um, rated as new to English at that time. How long do they take uh, on average to progress through? So our measure is going to be really when do 50% or more, by what point do 50% or more of pupils make a transition to the next stage? Um, because obviously not everybody will transition at the same rate, but it's reasonable to say once the majority have made a transition, that's a reasonable target um, to have. So let's just show you this in a, in a graphical form, really. Um, so this is our time to transition from new to English in reception. Um, this is time to transition from A to B, i.e. from new to English to early acquisition. So we start in reception. So at the end of year one, 31% of pupils who were new to English have transitioned to early acquisition. And by the end of the year, to 59%. So the majority have taken two years to transition um, from new to English to early acquisition. And actually, if you look subsequently all these years, you get up to 90% by year five. What about transitioning through further to developing competence? Um, slightly slower, but here by year four, 50% have, transfer, uh, have, have transitioned from A through to B to C. Um, so again, we're talking there on average about four years to get to developing competence. Um, what about making the jump all the way from new to English through to competent? Okay. Here, um, actually what we find is that even after six years, only just over 30% of young people have made that transition from new to English to competent. So actually there's a, a, a substantial um, issue here in that we cannot find a point within that within primary education where 50% or more have transitioned. It's a long uh, process according to this measure. Um, transition to fluent, um, only 10% make that transition. Um, but there are some issues about this distinction between fluent and competent um, that I'll come back to shortly. Um, these are the times for other transitions, you know, from B to C and from B to D. E. I won't go through those in detail now because I guess the time of time is a little bit limited. So some supplementary findings. So, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, at least two years to early acquisition, four years to um, comp developing competence and at least six years more um, to get competent fluent. That is robust to whether we eliminate Welsh medium schools. As I said, um, young people with Welsh as first language aren't included in this anyway. But in a Welsh medium school, clearly the medium of instruction, the language of instruction is Welsh. So actually how proficient you are in English is not that important. But actually our uh, findings are exactly the same if we uh, actually remove the Welsh medium schools because actually only 2.5% of EA pupils are in Welsh medium primary and only 0.3% of EAL pupils are in Welsh medium secondary. So actually very few EAL pupils are in Welsh medium schools anyway. So that's partly why it makes very little difference to the results. So they're robust to that control for Welsh medium schools. Uh, they're robust also to when you start school. So it may be that actually if you start with a whole cohort in reception, um, maybe you're um, more likely to make progress rapidly if you come in uh, on your own in year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, maybe you don't even make the net progress that we saw for that. So we actually did a test just looking at all young people that came in at level A 
in year one, year, year two, year three, year four, year five that we could follow for six years. But we found the same kind of pattern, um, two years to, to stage B, four years to stage C, more than six years to stage uh, DE. Um, so it it's, it's also seems to be um, valid for uh, later entrants. Um, there was a small proportion that we could track for eight years um, rather than six, but even those that we tracked for eight years, still only around 40% made this DE transition. It's a very much smaller sample size, so I don't think it's a particularly robust finding. Um, but it's not that they, suddenly everyone's transitioning, you know, in year seven. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case at all. Um, and I've talked in the report about competent and fluent together. I haven't made a distinction between competent and fluent. Now, there's very clear uh, distinctions made, and I think I don't clearly understand what those distinctions are if you look in detail, particularly at the detailed Bell framework. But actually, in terms of outcomes, there are some suggestions that this distinction between being competent and being fluent is not particularly robust. So it's very variable across time. It's very inconsistent in the relationships between uh, competence and fluence and achievements, and there's very large uh, local authority variations. So if we just look at what proportion are recorded as fluent or competent, and we look from 2009 to 2016, the proportion that recorded as fluent has changed massively over time, and not in a way that is actually particularly interpretable. So I don't see a particular reason why the proportion who are of EA or people who are called fluent has changed as rapidly as it has at certain key points, so between 2013 and 2014. And there may be a suspicion that this is related in some way to funding issues because this data was used for funding in Wales. And the relationship to achievement is, is rather strange. So actually, if we look at age seven, uh, the language literacy and communication um, scores, those who are rated competent actually have higher achievement than those who are rated fluent. Um, and indeed at 11, those who are rated competent and fluent had the same average um, achievement. So it doesn't, you don't see um, a clear relationship where fluent speakers um, have a higher attainment than competent speakers, again, suggesting that actually this distinction between competent and fluent isn't being very well picked up. And then, of course, there are also variations. So in Newport, uh, sorry, in, Car in Cardiff, which has the highest proportion of EAL pupils, 37% of young people are considered fully fluent, but only 7% in Newport. So, you know, there seems to be a lot of variation between local authorities, which isn't particularly understandable. So in the report, I've combined competent and fluent together and considered them as um, as the uh, as a single outcome. It may be that actually if we get through to using something like the Bell framework where we've got very clear statements and very clearly distinguishing what it is that people that um, fluent might do compared to people who are competent, we would get a better assessment than the overall best fit judgment. Um, but that's that's um, you know, something we don't know uh, from the current data. So conclusions on that, um, on average, it takes at least two years to progress from new to English to early acquisition, four years to developing competence, and at least seven to competent fluent. Um, at least for two thirds of pupils, they, they, they aren't there. Um, yet only one third have actually reached that competent fluent stage after six years. Um, this is somewhat longer than some really recent US research, which has come out tracking um, their English language learners which suggests about three to four years. Um, our data suggests a bit longer than that. What might be the reasons for that? Uh, it may be to do with the stakes of the assessment. So in the US, very high stakes assessment of English language learners and their transition to fluent English proficient. Um, uh, rigorous annual targets are set and there's a whole testing and reporting regime to support that. Um, and a very high level of compliance with that. So maybe that's because there's a real focus uh, on how that's done. Um, in Wales, in contrast, it's very low stakes. So in, in some ways, you know, that's not a, a bad thing. Um, but of course, it may be that, that one of our reasons um, then is that 
pupils aren't actually being assessed. Um, maybe you're not being shown as recorded uh, as competent or fluent because actually the assessment isn't being made because it is low stakes that actually there isn't the um, integrity in the data. Um, but I have to say, balancing against that, there is some level of moderation which the local authorities in Wales undertake. So every every uh, young person who's a Yale is meant to be recorded every year, and that's meant to be monitored. Um, and there is some evidence of validity for our time to transition measure. So those who make the transition most rapidly from A to B, for example, have higher attainment at the end of the key stage. So that's kind of what you'd expect. So those who transition more rapidly do, in fact, um, have greater facility with language and uh, achieve higher. And, and not quite the same for the A to C measure, but pretty much um, not for that first year. So that kind of says that our measure does look valid, that those who transition most quickly are those that have the highest achievement at the end. So it looks like that's a good indicator for, for the, um, for the um, validity of the measure. So not quite sure why the difference might be, but it might be something to do with the, with the high stakes nature of the US uh, system. So overall conclusions, because um, I'm uh, going over time here. Um, EAL pupils are an extremely heterogeneous group of pupils. We absolutely need to record the proficiency in English of individual students because it's the key factor relating to achievements. I think that's meant to be re relating to achievements. Um, must do better. Um, the abolition of the um, EMAG, the Ethnic Minority Achievement Grant in England in 2011, is problematic because we cannot assume that historical trends um, of uh, a relatively high achievement will continue without funding. And so, you know, including EAL within the national funding format is particularly welcome in that case, because we need to make sure that we want to have, you know, maintain historically high levels of achievement. We need to make sure that we're resourcing, particularly the young pupils um, who are coming in with not with insufficient fluency in English in order to access the curriculum. So uh, the National Funding Formula uh, gives over £500 for primary pupil and over £1,000 for a secondary pupil recorded as EAL for three years after their arrival. The only thing I would say um, about our data does suggest that actually that is um, money which could be better targeted. Um, so it's allocated to a third of pupils who um, in reception year are already r rated as competent or fluent. So it is being poorly targeted in the sense that some pupils have been given money when they are actually already proficient in English where others are not being given the money for long enough. Um, because we found that you know, there's six years minimum uh, is there. So maybe there's some issues about targeting. Um, and so I've just outlined there some um, options for how we might think about um, or uh, consider addressing the funding situation in the future. But that's probably enough from me, some references Thank you. there. Um, Thank you very much, Steve, for a fascinating presentation. I've got a number of very interesting questions, questions, so perhaps given that we haven't got a lot of time, if, if we give short answers, we might be able to, to add in a, a few more questions. So the first question from Olga Kara is whether you have looked at differences between those being born in Wales and those who arrived from another country into reception. Well, we don't have data on um, country of birth. At least I didn't. I didn't have access to that that data, um, so I can't specifically say uh, say that. But um, the proficiency in English is only collected on pupils whose language is not English or Welsh, um, and that's you know, that's that excludes basically Welsh Welsh speakers. That's the I think mean, that's the key point. Um, about thank you, Steve. Um, um, Anne Marie Proctor would Welsh like to know how confident you are about accuracy of assigning a level of proficiency in this Welsh data? I would say that what's important is that there is some degree of moderation and support, actually, for teachers. It's not all about you know, waving a stick at people. It's about actually giving them support to allow them to make um, robust and accurate judgments. Um, and it does seem that the local authority um, still has quite a strong position in the structure in Wales. 
Um, so there is uh, quite active involvement. I'm going to talk to the All Wales EAL group um, at the end of next month uh, to find out more about what it is that they do as part of the moderation process. But I mean, I think it's probably as robust as you can get through um, teacher moderation. Certainly there's more capacity for moderation in Wales than there is in England, given the lack of thought. Thank you. Amanda Gunn would like, she uh, says that she has a new student in year there. seven from India, a Hindi speaker and that this student has no English at the moment and she's just wondering what are the chances of her achieving five GCSEs at level four and above? Shall I repeat the question? Uh, what are the chances of her achieving? Um, well, uh, uh, one would say that and, um, until she has sufficient knowledge of English to access the curriculum, the chances are not good. Um, there may be some areas which, um, like maths, which um, maybe have a lower language demand, but there's still a language demand even in those kind of subjects. Um, so I would say that um, it's absolutely essential um, um, that if you are, want her to access the curriculum that you mm. enable her to um, acquire English at the most rapid rate. I mean, there may be, you know, there may be all sorts of support available in Hindi from community uh, organizations, from the parents. Um, there may be a lot of support for learning. Helen Speedy you know, um, asks, is, is there any data for pupils who are learning both Welsh and English with which to access the curriculum? Um, then they, yeah, I didn't have all of the data from Wales, and I think there is quite extensive data on how much young people use Welsh, but the main focus for me was on this proficiency in English measure. So I haven't really delved into all of that, and, and it would have been another data access request because um, you have to require um, specific items from the database. So now I didn't have the chance to look at that. But I'm sure someone, I'm sure there are Thank people. Thank you. The last but one question. Teresa O'Sullivan asks that, Given the variation in outcomes across schools and LAs, are there any plans in place that you know of in Wales to provide exemplification materials or conduct moderation sessions to promote greater consistency in assessment? I think there is a requirement on local authorities to moderate in Wales, and I understand that they do have moderation with all the schools in November prior to the collection of the data in January. But as I say, I don't know in any detail exactly what happens, and that no doubt varies between authorities and may happen in very different ways in different authorities. So I really And the last question that we have time for today, Olga again, have you looked at any interactions between the rate of progress and socio demographic variables? Yes, we looked at this time to progression measure um, and whether it related to any other demographics and it didn't relate to very many. Um, I mean, one would imagine that actually if you're facing other challenges like material or economic deprivation, um, it would have a negative impact if you had other circumstances like particularly supportive parents or bilingual parents that might be better, but we couldn't find anything obvious in, in the data. The thing that stood out was this uh, fact that those who make quick transitions do tend to have higher achievement by the time they're 11. So that's kind of the main... The, the well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. So thank you very, very much, Steve, for a very informative presentation with very important implications for policy, funding and support for pupils who are speakers of English as an additional language. I'm going to round up now. And before we close this webinar, I just wanted to remind you all that you will get an email tomorrow with a link to a video recording of this webinar, a survey and a blog post. You might be interested to know as well that we're running two short online introduction to EAL assessment courses, one for primary and one for secondary, which start next Monday. So we will include a link to the Eventbrite pages for booking this course tomorrow as well. Our work next webinar is on Thursday, the 26th of March at 4, and we will confirm more details next week, so please check our website. Thank you very much for taking part in today's webinar and thanks very much again, Steve, for giving us your time and sharing key findings of your research and their implications with us. We will now stop recording and I'm going to end the meeting now. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye.